says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to do will and to do his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and per perverse nation among whom ye, shall, ye shine as lights in the world. And that verse right there had the writer had to know what this world's going to come to. Talking about the, the perverse nation. We got a nation that is trying their best to take away the very deity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Everywhere you turn, they're trying to do away with everything that's biblical. And in time, it's going to come to that. We're going to be standing here one day. We're outside trying to get in 
there's going to be a padlock and maybe even a chain over that door that we can't get in because we don't have a key to it. I believe that. We may be gone when that happens. That's going to happen sometime. And we are very close to the what we know as the end of the world. I mean, it's going to take seven years for the tribulation to pass through. That seven years could start today. It could start tomorrow. But my Bible tells me, and I believe, that before the tribulation takes place, we're going to be out of here. I believe that. On the heart. Holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and the service of your faith, I joy. <laughs> And rejoice with y'all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own not the things which are Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ. But you know the proof of him, that as a son with a father, he has served me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently, as soon as I shall see how it go with me. But I trust in the Lord, that I also myself shall come shortly. Yet I supposed it necessary to send you to, I can't pronounce that word, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation. Because for, for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. Fathers, we come to you this morning, Lord, we're so thankful, Lord, for this church. We're so thankful, Lord, for the members. And Lord, we're thankful, Lord, for what you're doing in this church. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would lead, guide, and direct me, Lord, that I'd be the pastor, Lord, that the church needs, and I'd be the pastor, Lord, that the church wants, but more importantly, I'd be the pastor, Lord, that you'd have me to be. Lord, it's my heart's desire to serve you and do what you lay upon my heart to do. Father, I just thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name for what you're doing in this building. We thank you for your presence this morning, Lord. We ask these things in my holy precious name. Amen. 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 I want to talk to you about the obligations of a Christian. 
There are six things that I found. If I just go on three, I'm sure there's more obligations than this that a Christian should be doing. This is what I found Friday evening when I was studying. Just in an hour's time. Six things. It is a Christian's obligation to do. The first thing I found is we need to repent daily. God commands us to repent daily. I don't care how good you try to live. I don't care how close you are to God. You're going to fail. You're going to sin. It's impossible not to sin. I know when I'm using the hammer, Ola seen me using the hammer yesterday, and she knows how that goes. But usually when I'm using the hammer, it misses that nail. Every time, and it either lands on my finger, or my thumb, or the back of my hand. And I know we're supposed to give praise to God. But when you're hurting from that hammer hitting, it's kind of hard to find a place for praise. Amen? Now, I said that jokingly, but I'm, but I'm serious. I mean, when I get hit by a hammer, there's some words coming out of my mouth that shouldn't even be there. And I have to get down on my knees and repent for those words. And I'm sure that everyone in here has a bad day and they let something slip that shouldn't be coming out of their mouth. <laughs> Don't you thank God that we have a God that forgives us when we do mess up? When we stumble? He picks us up. He dusts us with salt. Sends us right back on our way. And all we have to do is to say, Lord, I failed you today. Your truth for me. And another thing we need to do daily is to pray. Don't get up in the morning and say, Whoa, oh, Lord, let me wake up this morning. I guess I'm bad at praying. You don't have that attitude. Pray. Be joyful when you cry. Thank God for what He's done for you. But don't just stop at the we pray it all day long. Pray for the sick. Pray for the unfortunate. Pray for somebody that's in worse shape than we are. There's always somebody out there. I don't care what kind of shape we get in. There's always somebody out there that's in worse shape than we are. We need to be praying constantly, continuously. If we pray 24 hours a day, constantly, we can still find something to pray about. You can't pray enough. And I'm, I'm a firm believer when we pray, if we're praying earnestly, God's going to answer the prayer. He may not answer it like we want him to. And he may not answer it when we want him to. But if we pray earnestly and seriously, God's going to answer our prayer. Like I say, it may not be the answer we want. But he's going to answer his prayer. In his time, he'll answer. 
Number three, another obligation of Christians, and you don't see this anymore, hardly ever, is helping those that are in need. If you see somebody that needs help, help them. I mean, you may see somebody that's got a $30,000 uh, medical bill. Now, I don't think there's anybody in here that can go pay off a $30,000 medical bill. But if you see somebody that's in need, we have an obligation to help them. It may be an individual help, or it may be help as a church. If you see somebody in need, I'm not talking about just money. If you go to somebody's house and their cupboards are empty, I'm going to take what money I got. It may not be but ten, twenty dollars, but I'm going to take what money I got in my pocket, and I'm going to the grocery store, and I'm going to buy groceries like I'm buying them for myself. And I'm going to take them to them. Like I say, it may not be 10 or, 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 or $20. But when I get some more money, I'm going to do it again. I believe in helping those that are in need. I'm not much for giving somebody money because you don't know where that money is going to go. But if you see somebody that has no food in their cabinets, go to the grocery store. Get them what you can. You may be like me. You may not ever have over ten or twenty dollars at one time. But spend what you got. Help those poor people out so they can have a meal. I've been there before. I've been sitting at home with nothing to eat. And a car would pull up. And they'd bring two or three weeks of groceries with them. And you don't know how that makes somebody feel when they don't know where their next meal is coming from. I believe that a true Christian is going to follow the obligation that God places on them. They're going to, I mean, that's what we're here for. We're here, we're on this earth to help others, to lead them to Christ. And if they're in need to help, amen. I believe that. That is our purpose on earth, is to help those in need, to help those who need it. Now, I'm not saying you got to help those that won't even help themselves. <coughs> but if you know a man or a woman tries their best to make ends meet, and they're doing their best, and they still need a little help, try a little time. Help them out. Now we're going to get into the rest there. God expects us to tithe. God expects 10%. Now, most people say, well, you know, I want to make $300 a week. How nice I send the kids to school? And Buy them clothes and everything the last year. Yeah. And I have to spread it out. You know, I can't do it all at once. I have to spread it out. There just ain't no money left, you know, for time. Well, I found out that if you put your tithes aside, first thing when you get home on payday, you put your tithes aside. Some people 
They took their cups. You know, like people that get paid once a month on retirement or disability, whatever. They kind of split up their tithes and they pay part of them one Sunday, part of them another Sunday, part of them the third Sunday, part of them the fourth Sunday. That's okay if you can hold on to it. But 10% of your gross income belongs to God. Now I know people has, I mean, different places, different jobs, they have the opportunities, you know, if you put back for Christmas or, you know, and people, they got the notion of what they bring home is their income. That's not your income. Your income is before anything's held out of it. That's what belongs to God. Not 10% of what you bring home. I mean, the way taxes are now, anyway, half, half you check uh, 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 probably young to taxes. Still, 10% of that gross income belongs to God. 10% of our time. Now, Phillips are tired. Ray's are tired. I just, what you say, retired. I'm on this building. So, how did I figure out my time? That's a good question. I figure out my time, my free time. I'm free every day. So I ought to be spending my time for God. Now God called me into the internet radio business about 12 years ago. And I spend about 80 hours a week trying the programs that people send me. I have to edit them and make sure they're going to fit the time slot, you know. I have to download songs daily, you know, to keep up with the latest songs that's coming out. And I spend about 80 hours a week just getting everything ready for the radio. So, now I'm not, I'm not bragging. But God gave me that ministry. And that's good use of my time. I'm using my time for God to get his word out through song and through the church service on the radio. And I work to join the church, his church is on the radio. And I'd love to have more, you know, but you can't get nobody to do nothing anymore. Nobody's interested in putting the word out so the world can hear it. And that's that's another obligation we have. It's getting the word of God out to a lost and dying world. But any church you go to, most people work 40 hours a week. I go two hours on Sunday morning. But if you'll notice in these churches, when that clock starts right around 12 o'clock, where the light is. And they're looking at the preacher. Hurry up. Hurry up. Let's go. Get finished. One of these days, I'm going to preach a sermon about two hours long. Just to see how many that we can pull up. No, I'll do that when God gives it to me. <laughs> but 
Forty hours a week. You need to you spend four hours a week at church. Okay. I mean, but it's like that on Sunday night. You go in, and choir sings some songs, and the preacher gets up, and everybody's kind of looking at their watch about seven o'clock. Straight up, I got to get in bed. I got to get up early in the morning. But everybody else does too. It works. What about these people that work 60 hours a week or 70 hours a week or 80 hours a week like, like Brother John does? Now that would mean that he'd have to be in church for eight hours a week. No, it don't mean that. It means he needs to give God that eight hours a week. Whether it be in preaching, whether it be out helping somebody, less fortunate than him or having a, a family Bible study. Nothing wrong with that. We need to give God his tithe. Everything we own, whether we realize it or not, everything we own belongs to because if it hadn't been for him blessing us, we wouldn't even have it. Amen? I love John's big red truck. It's beautiful. <laughs> but you know, he wouldn't have it if it hadn't been for God. Some of us don't have that nice of a vehicle, but what we have, God made it possible. My old soul out there is going to get, it's going to turn over 100,000 miles this week. 999, 400, or 500. But it's going to turn over sometime this week because I got I to go to the doctor and and sell them. And so I've got to learn to eat. <laughs> well, you know, most people, when they start at 100,000 miles, they don't ever get like that. They read this thing. I would love to have a new escalator. You know, I love them. They're beautiful. I can, I'd love to have one. God don't intend for me to have one because if he had it, if he had it intended for me to have one, that's what I'd be driving. But he knows I don't need it. It'd probably go to my head. My head would be so big I couldn't even get it in the door to sit down to stir in there if I had one. Look at me, I'm having an escalator. I mean, people's life in there. They get into something nice. God provides them with it. They forget all about God. All they care about is everybody sitting in here. Big, fat, and fancy vehicles. Vehicle ought to be the last thing on our mind. Really. If, we, if what we got gets us from point A to point B and then back to point A, we're fine. We're fine. Ain't that right, Brother Danny? <laughs> we are blessed with what God has given us. But yet we want more and more and more. We need to stick to our Christian obligation. God gave us what we have. We can keep it. Number five, it's a Christian's obligation to witness to. I don't care where you're at. I know a lot of jobs. If you witness to somebody, they'll fire you. If they if 
things back then, you know, you were doing it. Mean, they were hard. There's a lot of things you have to do. But I thank God I always worked with people that I was always in a Christian atmosphere. Everywhere I ever worked, except one place, I worked for a man that was an atheist. But I kept witnessing to him. I kept witnessing to him. One day he got mad and fired me. That was okay. I got to witness to him. But before he died, he got saved. I'm not saying it's the cause of nothing, but I've done my part. I witnessed him. It was hard. It was hard to find the word to witness to the person you don't even believe in God. All I know to do is just tell them how God still is in every way. And he got saved before he died. Somebody may have led him to the Lord. Or he may have realized that he didn't have long to live. And he got saved. And then he found him. Love his brother. He got saved before he died. And I know Rose has witnessed to him plenty of times. Played through with both of them have. And Barbara. But it paid off. He got salvation. Before he left this world. When we witness to somebody, we don't know what they're going to do with that once they receive it. If they receive it. A lot of people won't even receive it. They'll just never think of it. You know, they don't want to hear nothing about God. People like it. But we need to witness to everyone we come in contact with. I mean, you walk down the street. Hey, brother, how you doing? Nice weather, ain't it? You know, they're about to work in the gap over on the ground. Really? We ought to be, hey, brother, do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? The best friend you could ever have in this world. <coughs> he'll never forsake you, he'll never leave you. He's always there. You can do it. That's simple. Anybody can say that. And that's what we need to be doing when we meet up with somebody. Oh, hey, how you doing? Boy, that weather, these days are worse than this. I just can't hardly make it. Nobody wants to hear your problems. They want to hear something good. Give them some good news. Tell them about Jesus. And lastly, we need to be or let our light shine. We need, without saying a word, people are to look at us and say, he's a Christian. He's a Christian. Live a life that people can see that God is in. Nothing wrong with that. All we do is watch how we look, watch how we act, watch what comes out of our mouth. Be a light to others. You know, I can remember a time that you could go to town and you'd know everybody you see. You could walk in at Jordan's Market. Remember that? And you'd know everybody in there. Remember that now? But now, you ain't got but one choice. You go to England. Back then, you had choices where you could buy your groceries, or buy your meat, or whatever. But now, you go to England, and you walk in, you might see three people that you know. 
I'm serious. It's that bad. Because everybody that moves in here, they kind of stick to themselves. They don't really get out and mix and mingle with the local. And how do you get to know somebody if they're that stuck up? I, that's the only way I know food. <laughs> But I'm not saying they're all like that. I've got some good friends that come up north. I got some friends that are up in Florida. They're not all like that. But we need to let them see that Jesus lives in him. Without even having to say a word. Then We need to keep our obligations to the Lord. We need to have a prayer on our heart 24 hours a day. If you can't pray for nobody that long, put me in a pile. I guarantee you can find this stuff on me that will be praying for me that long. Because I ain't perfect. You show me a man that says he's perfect, I'll show you a liar. There's nobody on this earth that's perfect. We all have room for improvement. Amen. That's what God gave me today.